Thank you, David Olashaga. And good morning, IAPP. It's so wonderful to see you all. My name is Julie Brill. I am a member of the IAPP Board of Directors, and I serve as Microsoft's Chief Privacy Officer and Corporate Vice President of our Global Privacy and Regulatory Affairs Organization. Today, I have the distinct privilege of introducing you to our next keynote speaker, Brad Smith. Brad Smith is the President and Vice Chair of Microsoft, and he's my boss. Brad leads Microsoft's global teams working on the most critical issues at the intersection of technology, regulation, and society today. This includes cybersecurity, privacy, of course, artificial intelligence, sustainability, human rights, immigration, and philanthropy, and so much more. In all of these areas, Brad has been a leader in addressing how the technology industry can both innovate and advance the rights of individuals. The New York Times has named Brad the ambassador of the technology industry at large in recognition of his role in building bridges, bridges of understanding with policymakers and regulators that are so critical to the development of approaches that guide our industry and better serve humanity. In his best-selling book, which is called Tools and Weapons, The Promise and the Peril of the Digital Age, Brad urged the tech, in, the tech industry to assume more responsibility, and he encouraged governments to move faster to address the challenges that new technologies are creating. The continued vitality of Brad's message is well demonstrated by the discussions all of us are having here this week at, the, at our Global Privacy Summit. As we all continue to navigate the complex environment of data protection and AI and cybersecurity and online safety, Brad will continue to encourage us to think holistically about these challenges and how to work cooperatively towards solutions. And with that, please welcome Brad Smith. Good morning. It's so great to be here. I have to say one of the great things about my job is I get to work every day with Julie Brill. Yeah, yeah. That, the, uh, an another great thing about my job is I periodically get to come and speak to all of you and be part of these what are now called summits and interact with folks at the IAPP. I joined Microsoft in 1993. My first job was in Paris. The IAPP didn't yet exist. But I can say I remember when you could go to an IAPP meeting and you would just sit around a table. And then it would fill a room. And now, as you all attest, it literally is bursting at the seams of a huge convention center. And each year, the issues have changed, the profession has grown, but along the way, over the last two decades, I think something remarkable has happened. You have advanced what has become one of the great human rights issues of our time, quite literally, and it's because of the explosion of technology. But it's not just that the cause is critical, it's also complex. That's why we need so many people in the privacy profession. You can't protect human rights if you can't manage the complexity that technology has created for the world. And in a sense, where you have gone, we are now at a point where I think many others will need to follow, not just for privacy alone, but for many other legal and regulatory fields as well, in a much more closely integrated way. So fundamentally, my thesis this morning is relatively straightforward. It's this. This decade, the 2020s, have created a new era for technology. Unlike the last few decades, we've entered a decade, we've entered an era that is characterized by both technology innovation 
and technology regulation. And we are going to need to find new ways to manage through this. We're going to need a large community of people like you. You will be, in some ways, the foundation for it. We will need thoughtful conversations literally around the world, but perhaps more than anything, it will take a new mindset if the world is going to manage this well. So let me show you what we see, and let me show you why we think this is the case, and then I want to talk about what it will take, what the ingredients will be in order to develop the mindset and the capability for all of us to manage technology through the decade ahead. The first thing is in some ways obvious, but only if you really look up and look at the world as a whole. Every day, governments are creating complex regulatory requirements for technology. We, like uh, many companies and institutions, follow this not just in one place, but every place. And what we see is an explosion of technology laws and regulations and proposals that is literally sweeping the planet. I just came back from nine days in four countries in Africa, and everywhere I met, it wasn't just on the agenda of ministries of ICT. It was important to presidents and prime ministers as well. And what we're therefore seeing is something that started with privacy in the 1990s and is now leading to a long list of new and emerging and changing legal and regulatory fields. Cybersecurity, digital safety, responsible AI, telecommunications, competition, trade, accessibility. This list is not even complete. That is what is happening around the world. But I think it's important to step back and not just ask what is happening. It's perhaps even more important to ask why. Why is this happening? Why is it happening now? Why is this decade going to be different from the past? I think there's two ways to look at it. The first is through the lens of the present and look at the role that technology is playing. It really is a tool that can be put to use to help solve any problem anywhere in the world. As you just heard, you can't manage through a pandemic without use of data. You can't address climate change without putting data to work. You can't address anything effectively without harnessing the power of digital technology and data together. But technology is not just a tool. It really has become a weapon. It's become a weapon in so many ways and shapes and forms, directly and indirectly. And believe me, 2022 has made this clearer than ever, as we at Microsoft see every day, oftentimes every hour, as we are helping the government of Ukraine defend its military and civilian institutions from an ongoing and unprecedented wave of cyber attacks. This is what technology has brought to the world. And for all of us who create it, we're so proud, and rightly so, of what we get to do, and yet we also have to be clear-eyed as we look around the world. We have to address the problems that technology has created. But there's another way that I find it helpful to think about why this is happening. It's to look at this not just through the lens of the present, but through the lens of the past. When we think about the future, in some ways, I think it all started in one place in one year. The place was Washington, D.C., and the year was 1887. What happened in 1887? Well, let me take you back for a moment to the greatest technology change of the 1800s. It was called the railroad. In 1840, there were just a few railroad lines in the Northeast United States. But as you look at this unfold, decade by decade, railroads stretched across the continent. They helped the North defeat the South in the Civil War. They connected the East Coast with the West. And by 1890, they led to a map that basically looked like what it had become. Railroads 
had become the central nervous system of an entire country. One of my favorite books that I think speaks to the issues that we deal with every day, all of us in this room, was written two decades ago. It wasn't about digital technology, it was about railroads. It's called Railroads and American Law. And the professor who wrote it said, few aspects of American society were untouched by the railroad. He quoted a newspaper story that said, the railroad has revolutionized everything. If that sounds familiar, this author recognized two decades ago the familiarity as well. He said, at its peak, the railroad was the internet of its day in the extent of its impact on American life and law. In fact, if you just read the table of contents of this book, what you see is the way the railroad changed, influenced, altered field after field of American law and regulation. It literally changed the way Americans check the time. It led to the invention of the time zone. You had to have standardized time zones so everybody would know when the darn train was going to arrive at the station. No longer could each town set its own clock. But it wasn't just this piecemeal change of law after law, although that is fundamentally what took decades to happen. There was something even more remarkable that took place. Not surprisingly, the state governments recognized that in order to regulate railroads effectively, they needed to worry about what was happening on the train before it got to its state and after it left. They increasingly reached beyond their borders. And in 1886, the Supreme Court said that state law did not reach beyond a state's border. So it was the next year, in 1887, that Congress broke a decade-long stalemate and created the Interstate Commerce Commission for one specific purpose, to regulate railroads. That act, that year, really marked the birth of the modern regulatory state. And so much of what so many people work with today is the legacy of what was created. There are cars that are regulated by the Department of Transportation. There are airplanes by the Federal Aviation Administration. There are pharmaceuticals by the Food and Drug Administration. There are telephones by the Federal Communications Commission, all while the Department of Justice and FTC do their jobs as well. But what we've seen in the United States and what we've seen around the world is increasingly, over the course of a century, agencies that were created to regulate specific industries that were based on specific inventions and areas of technology. That is the past that almost inevitably will shape the future. But the future is never a replay of something we like to say, one of our favorite quotes, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And what's important to think about are both the similarities and differences. And there is one fundamental difference about the world today for digital technology and data. No industry has ever had to adapt so quickly to new law and regulation on a global basis. These other industries were national industries. The telephone was national. Even something that we think of as a global market today, like automobiles, took a long time to globalize. There were 49 years between Henry Ford's invention of the Model T in 1908 and the first import of a Japanese car into America. That was a long time for regulators to work on a national basis. Today, technology has gone global, and as you all know, as you all represent, given all the countries here in this room, this is a global exercise. So what are we going to need to do? I think it involves four ingredients. First, I think it's time to recognize reality. The tech sector needs to mature. And we need to lean in to help make a new era of regulation work. 
We need to recognize that the need to serve the common good vastly outweighs the regulatory opportunities for competitive advantage. The press loves to focus on a new law. Is it going to help this company? Is it going to hurt that company? The reality is regulation applies to everyone, and there will be only fleeting days and very short periods of time when one company or part of the industry benefits at the expense of another. We all need to recognize, in my view, and not just in the tech sector, but across the business community, that our common goals and the common good and even the common bonds we share vastly outweigh any differences in perspective. That's part of what it will take for our industry, frankly, to mature. But there's a second thing we need to recognize. We need to recognize it around the world, but we need to recognize it most especially in the United States. And it is important not just for the tech sector, it is important for every part of the economy. Progress in a democracy always requires compromise. We live in an era where compromise is too difficult to find. And there is no better case study, in my view, of this than U.S. privacy law. In 2005, I came to Washington. I gave a speech to the Congressional Internet Caucus, and we were one of the first companies to call for the adoption of a broad and comprehensive national privacy law. That was 17 years ago. You can just see how influential that speech was. <laughs> but just think for a moment about where we are today. I would argue that in some ways it's shocking. I think we need to recognize here in Washington, D.C. and across the country that comprehensive privacy legislation for the United States is not just needed, it's long overdue. Let's just look at what has happened around the world while our Congress has been frozen in time. When we look at national privacy laws, it started in France and Germany and Denmark and the Nordics in 1989. In the 1990s, it started to move across to 2009. It spread further. By 2018, it had reached most of the world. Here we are in 2022, there's more than 120 jurisdictions around the world that have passed a national privacy law, and the United States increasingly stands alone. And the fact of the matter is, in my view, there is a critical element that we are failing to think about in the United States. It's that the failure of the United States to legislate doesn't stop global regulation. It doesn't even slow it down. It just makes our country less influential in the world. And for a country like ours that has rightly so long aspired to be a beacon of hope and the protection of fundamental rights, we don't do ourselves a service. We don't help the world when we sit on our hands. And just think for a moment about the two issues that lead to continued deadlock in Congress in 2022. One involves a private right of action. The other involves preemption. These are two issues that have been part of every consumer protection law in the United States for more than a century. Why is it that in the 1930s and 50s and 70s and 90s, people could come together, but in our own day, they cannot? It's because we're not signed up to embrace the importance of compromise. And that is part of the mindset that we need to change. But this isn't something that the tech sector or the business community can work by itself to advance. We need well-informed coordination within governments, within every government around the world. For those of us who build technology, for those of you who work with technology and apply it to your employer's business, one thing is clear, as I said before, it is complicated. And that the more you work with technology, the more you come to realize 
that frankly some things are easier to design than they are to build. Some things are easier to build than they are to operate. I love this photo. This is the plane, the Spruce Goose. It was paid for by the United States government in World War II. It was designed and built by Howard Hughes. And in 1948, it got 30 feet off the water, and that's the highest it ever flew. We can't afford, from a regulatory perspective or a legal perspective, to put in place the kinds of rules that are going to make it impossible to build the technology the world needs. And that's going to require more dialogue. It's going to require a broader vision. It's going to require governments to think from left to right about every technology issue. And that's what we're starting to see. That's what this White House has advanced with a bipartisan commission to look at the future of technology. And that is a good example of what we're going to need. I think another of the most important early innovations of the 2020s comes from the United Kingdom, where they brought together the principal regulatory agencies and have created a digital regulation cooperation forum to coordinate among them. <clears throat> but think about what the world has done for every other industry and area of technology. Think about the Food and Drug Administration. Think about the Federal Aviation Administration. Think about the Federal Communications Commission. The most important question for us to think about is this. What would a digital regulatory commission look like? What would its scope be? How would it work? Would we be better served to place in the hands of people pursuant to the rule of law the ability to learn and master the facts for an industry and craft carefully very thoughtful rules. Is that a better future than asking a Congress or a legislature or a parliament to go on a piecemeal basis and ch change each and every law separately and with less coordination? One should always, I think, be a little nervous in inviting a government to be more powerful in regulating yourself. But the truth is, in a world where regulation is becoming a reality, we need thoughtful regulation. And this is probably the conversation we need to have in the years and in this decade ahead. But because all of this is happening on a global basis, we need a third thing as well. We need coordination across borders. We're not in great shape, to be honest. Look at the privacy shield. An issue that took four months to resolve five years ago has taken 18 months this time. Things are getting, in some ways, more difficult rather than easier. And oh my gosh, just think about, as you all, I think, often see, what it means to work with technology where regulation is spreading so broadly and in so many legal fields. I sometimes get up in the morning and I feel like I'm supposed to go to work with some giant spreadsheet in my head. Every row is an area of law. Every column is a jurisdiction that's adopted a new law. Every day there seems to be another column. And that's just for one product. Every spreadsheet, every, sorry, every product needs its own spreadsheet. The world will not be able to manage this level of regulatory growth, this creation of complexity, without better coordination across borders. And then finally, we need one last thing as well. Maybe it's the most important thing. It is definitely, in my opinion, where you all will be critical. We need people who can think creatively. We need people who can think across boundaries. We need privacy regulators and professionals and practitioners who recognize that even privacy itself is much less siloed than it used to be. Some of the leading privacy issues of our time involve the intersection between, say, privacy and the protection of children. With digital safety, it's the intersection between privacy and cybersecurity. Or as you just heard, the intersection of privacy and the protection of public health. We need to think across the traditional intellectual boundaries that in some ways have perhaps too narrowly subscribed our thinking in the past. 
Two months ago, I took my third trip to the Vatican, my first since COVID, and it, to me, is always a profound experience because more than anything else, it stands for a simple proposition. The world's great philosophers, the world's great religious leaders, the humanities, the social sciences, all have so much to contribute. They all have so many views that need to be heard for us to think creatively and comprehensively the way the world will need. In sum, I will say this, this is not going to be easy. I had a conversation with one of the senior most regulatory officials in Europe a month ago, and as that person said, look, the fundamental problem is straightforward. Democracies have waited so long to regulate this technology that now we need to catch up, we need to go fast, and to quote verbatim, this will not be beautiful. That may be the case, but we don't want it to be ugly either. We need to make it as beautiful as we can. And at the end of the day, while I think the challenges to doing this well are so complicated and formidable, I also believe in a very optimistic way that the future can indeed be bright. And I will end on a personal note because I think my personal experience represents the journey that one can take. When I was in my early years at Microsoft, we faced the worst antitrust legal decision that any company had been handed in decades, literally a court order to break the company up. When I became the company's general counsel in 2002, it became my task to try to go enter into peace agreements, not just with governments around the world, but with companies across the industry. And it was a long and arduous and even painful task. On this day, in 2007, I got to stand up in front of 200 reporters and explain why this 200-page legal decision that had just been handed down didn't even have a footnote in our favor. It was not an easy process. But we came to terms with it. And more than anything else, I realized that you can find a way to navigate through the thicket of demands, expectations that others have of you. And when I look at my job today, I am so happy <laughs> that most of my time is spent on very different issues. We focus in our mission on how to bring internet and broadband access to more people and promote skilling and create job opportunities. How to put technology to work, not just to protect Ukraine, but every democracy and the most fundamental rights around the world. How to harness the power of technology to build a more sustainable future and perhaps most fundamentally, to build technology that the world can trust, starting with privacy. This is what you all represent. This is the foundation that you have built. But it's not just a foundation to which the world can look for inspiration. It is the future. It is a future that can be bright if we lean in, if we embrace a new mindset, and we go forward together. Thank you very much. So thank you, Brad Smith, for that very compelling and vehement case for uh, regulation and uh, new privacy rules that span the federal uh, government. So um, ironically, um, I'm with a technology company that really aims to help organizations automate some of that uh, regulation and compliance. So my name is Dimitri Sirota. I'm the CEO of Big ID. Uh, this is my third time at um, uh, IPP Global Congress. I first came here in 2018 as a vendor. Um, and it's in incredible to see how far it's come just in the three years that I've been coming. Um, in 2018, uh, myself and my co-founder actually had to set up our own booth and technology for global regulations compliance were a new thing. GDPR was just about to come out um, and we were really part of, part of a pioneering crew 
Uh, and it's amazing to see today, not only with all of you uh, here in the audience in terms of professionals uh, working and helping organizations deal with some of these uh, regulations and provide greater transparency to consumers and employees and, and, and that, but also seeing all of the new vendors and technologies out there that are aiming to help provide um, greater controls um, and uh, transparency around how organizations collect and process and dispose data. So uh, it's been an amazing ride. Looking forward to seeing many more years here uh, in DC with, uh, with you folks. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our next panel. Um, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Neil Richards, uh, Koch uh, Distinguished Professor in Law at Washington University uh, School of Law. He'll be the moderator. And with him will be Julia Angwin, Editor-in-Chief and Founder of The Markup, and Cecilia Kang, National Technology Correspondent for The New York Times. So without further ado, I welcome them. Thank you. I'm, I'm Neil Richards, as, as he said, uh, and I'm delighted to be joined today by, by two of the, the most insightful, articulate uh, journalists working, I think working at all, but certainly in technology, uh, Cecilia Kong and Julia Angwin. Um, and I thought to, to start things off, uh, it'd be interesting to hear about the different perspectives that our two journalists bring from very different organizations, the New York Times and, and, and the markup. So I'll, I'll start with, uh, with, with you, Julia. Uh, how did you get to be running the markup, and, and what is your beat, uh, or what is the, the, the markup's beat? And then I'll, I'll ask the same question of Cecilia. Sure. It's so great to be here, by the way. I've been coming to IAPP for so many years, and um, it's amazing how many people are here. It used to be a couple hundred people in a hotel lobby, if I remember correctly. Um, I am a technology journalist, and I, um, I grew up in Silicon Valley, and actually thought um, that I would go into technology. And I, um, I wanted to go into software, but then I fell in love with journalism. And flash forward, I was at the Wall Street Journal, I think it was around 2008, and I realized that the industry that I covered, software, was, um, had changed. You used to buy software in boxes, it was shrink-wrapped, and you paid money for it. And all of a sudden, it was free, and they were doing something with your data that seemed weird. And I was like, what is this new, I really thought of it as, a, what is this new business model that's out there? Because it seems kind of creepy. And so I started a series there called What They Know at the Wall Street Journal about privacy and like what was happening with your data. And I eventually, I, th I thought it would be a one year series and that's, uh, 12 years later, and I'm still on the same story, essentially. Um, I, I did three years of that investigation at the Wall Street Journal, then I went to ProPublica, and then I eventually felt that there was just a need for there to be a newsroom really devoted to this particular question of the world of, I don't like to call it privacy, I call it the data exploitation market. Um, and so I, I felt like there needed to be some place that really specialized in writing about this. And so I founded The Markup, which is a nonprofit newsroom. And if you haven't been to our website, it's themarkup.org. And we write about all of the issues um, that technology enables, privacy being one of them. But we also write a lot about algorithmic biases and other um, ways that the world of digitization has allowed policy decisions to be embedded into opaque black box systems that you can't examine. And I think that that is all enabled by the incredible massive collection of data about us that builds and empowers all of those systems. And so we have a newsroom that is half engineers and half journalists. And so we take a very technological approach to our coverage using advanced techniques to examine this world. So that was a long answer. <laughs> so that's a great answer. And I, I love the way you describe um, this, this term that you, you, you just mentioned, data expectation market, um, the set of privacy. Because I view a lot of my job as 
just telling readers what's really going on, you know, as a technology journalist. And I think this is, and that question, the answer to that question has really changed over time. We've seen a real evolution in technology reporting. And just to back up, I'm a technology reporter based in Washington for the New York Times. And before joining the Times about seven years ago, I was at the Washington Post pretty much doing the same thing for about a decade. So I've also been following a lot of the same stories for a long time. And I can humbly say we're still figuring it out and we're still trying to tell you what's really going on. And just to flash back to an anecdote that, that I think illustrates that is around 2010, I remember having, um, being in a press conference actually with then Facebook, now Meta, um, executives, and they kept saying, the executives in this call saying, we have the best privacy controls of any company in the world. We have the most, like the mo we give consumers the most control over all of their, their data. And they would say that on the Hill when they would visit members of Congress. And what we really realized is that we didn't at that time, what I realize now is that at that time, I didn't really quite understand what that meant. It was almost a distraction from what was really happening. Yes, there were tons of different drop down um, options that you'd have on Facebook on how, who could see your data. But what that was obscuring or distracting from was the fact that the company was gobbling up so much data and that was, and that advertisers were getting access to that data. And it took quite some time for folks on the Hill, for journals to realize that's actually the ball we should be chasing, not how many controls every consumer has. And I use that, I mentioned that anecdote to describe that these are the kinds of things that we're trying to figure out to look behind the messaging oftentimes of companies to tell consumers how does this, how do these decisions and the technologies that are being created by these incredibly powerful companies affecting you as individuals. And so we're just digging constantly and we're still in the same story. I, I completely agree with you about control. Um, as an academic whose job it is to be uh, insightful and perhaps critical of, uh, of the world that we, that we see around us. Um, I, I agree that I think, I think control is a myth. It's an argument that I've explored in, in some of my writing, including at the risk of shameless self-promotion, my new book, Why Privacy Matters. But putting that to one side, um, in, in identifying things like the, 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 the smoke screen that is informational self-determination or putting users in control of their data, how do you guys approach your role of informing the public, if that is indeed what you see your role as, and, and, but, but assuming that it is, how do you figure out how, which stories to prioritize, which concepts to try and get in people's minds, and how do you go about crafting those stories so that the, your readers can understand what, what they need to understand what's going on? Um, well, it's a great question because I think when I first started writing about privacy in 2010, um, it was actually, you just had to convince readers that there was even something to worry about. Really, people weren't focused on this issue. And so um, there was a lot of why this matters. And that's still true to some degree, but I feel like the people now understand a lot better than they did that in all their data is being collected, it's being used for weird things. Cambridge Analytica was a big wake up call for people. And so I think that the, the issue for journalists now is uh, to be a little bit more precise about the harm, about um, exactly what types of cutting edge techniques are being used against them. One thing that we did at the markup is we realized that there was so much happening um, and we can't, a lot of people, um, you might read a story about some app that's stealing your data, but you don't use that app, so it doesn't really matter to you. So we thought, let's build a tool where readers can actually learn about whatever they want. So we built this thing called Blacklight, and if you haven't gone to it, it's a tool where you just enter the URL of any website, and we actually run a real-time forensic privacy analysis at that moment of what types of techniques it's using. So it tells you about how many cookies and how many um, trackers and which companies, but it also tells you things that you wouldn't really know um, that are pretty advanced, like are they doing what's called session recording, where they record every movement of your, bra of your mouse and where you scroll on the page and send like a little video of your actions back. 
are they using some techniques like the Google remarketing cookie, which basically is tracking you across other websites um, in addition to the Google Analytics that you're on that page. And so it really is an amazing way to see how different websites act. And people write to us all the time, like, you know, I was able to check my kid's school and I saw that they were doing this thing and that's really wrong and I wrote to the principal and they changed it. And so I feel like we've given people a chance to do their own advocacy around um, these issues and I think that is what people want, is they want to know a little bit more precisely, not just generally bad, scary things are happening, but what bad, scary things are happening to me. <laughs> yeah, I would say that's, it's a real challenge in writing about privacy is that it can feel very abstract and that the, the harm does not feel immediate, nor does it feel tangible for, for a lot of readers. So um, looking for the stories that can be animated by real life anecdotes, um, you know, how, how a new technology tool, um, a new collaboration between companies, um, a regulatory decision translates or has a downwind effect and affects real individuals. That's sort of the, the, the magic sort of rubric we're trying to you know, look through, uh, trying to find stories through which to write about. It's hard, it's really hard. And we were talking backstage about, for example, even Cambridge Analytica as a story, which was a watershed moment, incredibly important to really, and surfaced a lot of concern and interest in business models and decisions from like decades ago about opening up a platform like Facebook and how data is being used differently. It takes like five paragraphs to explain even what Cambridge Analytica is. And it can be for some readers, just kind of something that make, either makes their eyes glaze over or just goes over their head. And the challenge is to, we, we believe at the times is our service is really to explain to the public in very accessible ways why they should care, what's really going on, and sometimes the best way is to do it through anecdotes, through real individuals. But you know, in terms of trying to find the, the stories, there's, there are limits, frankly, in, an, in a newspaper story. And this is one reason why we wrote our book, my co-author and I, is because we realized that there was so much more than the one-off stories to explain what was really happening at now meta, um, we needed to, we wanted to, and we needed to explain to readers what the business model was. And those are the kinds of things, again, that it's sort of a work in progress that all journalists are doing a fantastic job. And I should say, Julia was like a pioneer. Her Wall Street Journal story series was like, that opened everyone's eyes that they should care. It's that kind of evolution that took place to get to the point where we can now assume that Consumers have a, readers have a baseline knowledge of data privacy and what that means and build on that in terms of new stories. It's interesting that the, the process of, of public education um, and the, 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 the level of sophistication with which the public can talk about privacy today. Um, we're no longer having the conversation, is privacy out of date or is it, people get it, they, they seem to they seem to care, because they do care, because they realize that it's about avoiding harm and it's also about avoiding manipulation and the data confers power. Um, but but al along the lines of, of your book, you've both written long form pieces of journalism in books. Y your book, An Ugly Truth, and, and Julia's book, um, Dragnet Nation, um, but both of which are highly recommended, w wonderful treatments. How do you see the relationship between the long form journalism in a book versus the, 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 the shorter form journalism of of you know new tr traditional or, or in Julia's case some non-traditional but but news stories that that are that are, are more ephemeral. Um, yeah, I mean my book uh, Dragnet Nation came out in 2014, and it's so hilarious to me now because I felt at the time that I was writing a pretty you know overheated like things are going to be bad. You guys need to be wake up call. And then when I look back at it, I was actually under paranoid. Like I did not see some of the things coming. I did not see how quickly facial recognition was gonna become um, mainstream and used ubiquitously and, and certainly not in like these crazy ways like with Clearview AI where it's just wild and unregulated scraping of photos from the internet. And, um, and so I think back on that book as like, Wow, um, I was trying to t I was trying to get people 
interested in this topic. And the way I did it was by trying to protect my own privacy. I spent a year trying all these different techniques, using burner phones, using Tor web browser, using lots of things that mo most of you are familiar with probably. And the point of that exercise was not actually to succeed. It was to show the reader that this is no way to live and maybe regulation or some other <laughs> way that we can handle this because trying to deal with it as an individual problem is not really solvable. And that was the question that I was trying to answer that I couldn't answer in my journalism, right? Was the question that everyone asked me, the reason I wanted to write that book was they were like, well, why should I care? I don't have anything to hide. I, um, I use you know, this one web browser, so I'm safe. And I wanted to explain that this is a collective problem, and it needs collective solutions. And I'm going to show you by trying to pursue the individualistic solution and show you how failed it is. And so I think that's the purpose of these books, is to answer those bigger meta questions that are, in, that are raised by the reporting that are really hard to answer in any of these formats, in a long form investigative piece or even a short explainer article. And Cecilia's yeah. book is about the meta question, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, no uh, pun intended. So they, um, so yeah, our, I agree with everything that Julia just said. For, for us, our book, um, was actually born from our reporting at the New York Times. We found that we were in many ways writing the same story over and over again when it came to Meta. Um, it was it was big scandal or crisis that surfaces into the public, you know, huge cry of apology from an executive, promises to do better, and then repeat the cycle. And we found ourselves, Shira Frankel and I, asking ourselves as well as you know the smart people who we turn to for our sources over and over is this are these accidental or is there is there some sort of idea or like some sort of theory behind these this pattern and that was our animating question in terms of asking the big meta question was like what is behind this this series of apologies over and over again and what we found is actually it was not really a Frankenstein's monster getting away from its creator story that was totally unpredictable. In fact, the machinery of Facebook being the business model and the technology were working as intended. And that was sort of our thesis. And that's what we came up with after interviewing so many hundreds of people. And so that was, that we could not do necessarily in a newspaper story, but it was absolutely developed from the corpus of work that we had developed at the New York Times, at the Washington Post, and for her as a foreign correspondent in so many other places. And so it all built on each other. But the book, the, the service, I think, to Julia's point as well, that a book provides is to connect the dots also, because you're reading all these stories and you're thinking, OK, I think I should feel bad about Edward Snowden. I think I should feel bad about you know Cambridge Analytica. I think I should feel bad about these things that we're reading about off and on. But how does this all, what's the method or the theory behind this? And it was kind of clear. It was the business model. What are you, what are you working on now? What, what, what issues, or what will you be working on? What, what are the issues that, that you guys think are going to be the ones that are, that are worth covering in depth? The ones that, are, that have the, Sorry. the capacity to capture the public imagination um, as, we, as, as you hope to advance this public understanding in the service of, of advancing informed public debate and deliberation on, mm. on, on the sorts of regulatory questions that Brad Smith was just talking about? I mean, I think we're in a really interesting time, as Brad talked about. We're on the cusp of, of regulation and tech policy um, in the US, which has been really stalled, um, is now happening. It's not happening at the federal level, but it's happening at the state level, and state after state are passing privacy laws. And um, the reality is that those are probably going to conflict with each other and create the need for a federal harmonization. And so what's happening is the policy is being written in places where people aren't paying attention, right? Most state capitals, their journalism has been totally depleted, you know, and it's worth noting that. Um, the rise of big tech uh, has uh, directly impacted um, journalist revenues. And so one of the things that has happened over the years is that um, 
you know, my profession, our profession is um, cratering. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and that's a real harm to democracy. Yeah. And so one thing, by the way, that just people ask all the time is what is the harm of creepy ads following you on the internet? And one of the harms is the destruction of journalism, which, by the way, might lead to um, the destruction of democracy because you need watchdogs on power, uh, otherwise you don't have a check on power, and journalists, our job is to be a check on power. And so right now what you see that I'm very worried about is a lot of really important laws being written at the state level without very much oversight. And so I think that we're in a world where, honestly, the, the companies who are the most to gain from gaming these laws can easily influence them at the state level and um, really set policy in a way where people are not paying any attention. So I'm, um, the markup was written about this and we are writing more about this and there's, this is one of many issues. Obviously there's European regulation as well, but I think in the US the state privacy laws is the thing to watch. Th there is this great irony that um, as someone who's sort of been an adult and a lawyer and an academic through the, the, the growth of what we think of now as the internet, that a, that a set of technologies run by companies that were touted sincerely as, as promoting the information age and, and allowing everyone to have access to information have simultaneously had a business model that has undermined the foundation of the journalism that we need to make sense of this, this fire hose or torrent or uh, choose your watery metaphor here of, of information that is, that, that, that is washing over us. Um, what, what do you think is, is coming next? And, yeah, I mean, how journalism, particularly traditional print journalism, uh, yeah. can rise to the challenge. Yeah, I mean, I think the technology, um, data expectation markets, as well as um, a lot of the regulatory action that's that's happening right now, makes this probably one of the best beats. I think I probably have one of the best beats of the paper right now, and I think very few people would agree with me. <laughs> so, which is fine with me because I'm happy to do this because this is the nexus of power, it's the nexus of, um, uh, of, of government accountability, this is, these are the things that we should be writing about as journalists. So I'm really fascinated with what's happening in the market itself, um, how Apple, um, as my colleague Kara Swisher says, Tim Cook is America's privacy regulator right now. Um, I think that that's, you know, whether you agree with it or not, there's, a, there's some interesting truth in that. Like we're seeing real market changes because of a decision by Apple on its ATT product. Um, it's really interesting to see consumer behavior change. And you see this with the earnings reports from Google and Meta and all these other companies. And especially at, um, at Meta, you're seeing younger users leave the site. So consumers are changing their habits. And on the regulatory landscape, super fascinating what's happening on the local, state level, national level, which is, I'm sorry, I'm one of the only people here that may think, I don't think that there's gonna be federal regulation, regulation very soon at all, but maybe I will eat my lunch when I, if I'm wrong. Um, but really importantly also, the splintering of the global internet and different regulatory changes. We hear about the splinter net, but how, what does it mean to have essentially three types of internet, maybe now two different types of internet? And what does that mean in terms of our world and thinking about sort of big themes like as a global society and how we're accessing and viewing and thinking about information differently and communicating differently? That's fascinating. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I want to end with, with a final question that I think will be of great interest to possibly everybody in the room, which is how do pe privacy professionals, uh, people in what is in large part a, a compliance and risk management industry, avoid appearing on the front page of the New York <laughs> Times or the byline of the markup? Um. Try not to sell your users' data in bulk to massive data brokers unanonymized um, <laughs> and, um, and then not be honest about it in your privacy policy would be a starting point. Um, but I would say like it is- Are, are you reading privacy policies? Uh, we read, yeah, we, I mean, yeah, we are one of the few people who read them. Um, you can, uh, so you guys will be appreciative. There is an audience for your I work. I saw a fist bump from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Yeah. I read them too. So this is a conflict of interest. I need you to be on <laughs> my stories. 
Well, listen, I think that... Oh, so, so in negative stories, right. So, so w what are the sorts yeah, of things Yeah, it's a conflict that, of interest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I think what's, what, what the, the smarter we are, the better off everyone is, right? If you try to, to duck and, you know, dodge and, you know, actually distract and sometimes deceive, then that's problematic for everybody. The story eventually gets out and you also don't build goodwill and the public needs to understand, you know, if you, if you're, you know, if, if they're, these are complicated topics and, you know, like just for example, I was trying to write a story about the ad tech market. Oh my God, like try to write that for a New York Times audience, you know, it's like really, really um, hard to make it accessible and it, write something about that in plain language. Just if, I'm very grateful when I'm able to talk to privacy experts and professionals who can be so generous as to lend their knowledge. And um, that's a good way to appear in a story, I would imagine. So it's not such a conflict of interest. Not such a conflict of interest. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, we are, we are at the end of our time. So please join me in thanking Cecilia Kong and Julia Anglin. First of all, I just want to thank our keynote panel, Professor Olusoga, Brad Smith, Neil Richards, Julia Anguin, and Cecilia King. Let's give them a round of applause for an amazing <laughs> keynote. My name is Dominique Shelton Leipzig. I am a proud member of the IAPP board and a partner at Mayor Brown. I do lead the global data innovation team. What we heard today from Brad and uh, Professor Olusoga is that data is now no longer a compliance issue, but a business imperative. We have a situation where data is in the positionally in the in midst of moving markets. I was reading uh, about the NASDAQ market share of 1.3 trillion lost just at the end of March. We are generating 2.5 quintillion bytes of data per day. Uh, so the global pandemic has, uh, in that matter, will only increase, as Brad was talking about, the connected devices that we have. Listening to uh, Cecilia and Julia talk about tracking ad tech, this is uh, really a $800 billion market that is in flux. All of us here have an important role to play in how the, sh the future is shaped. And so I hope you all will continue to enjoy the rest of the conference, uh, interact with each other, and use this opportunity to continue the dialogue when you get back to your homes. Thanks so much and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. See you.